Okay, good morning all. Welcome to the presentation today by Netherlands historian Bas Kruger. From me, a very warm welcome to our special guest today, Mr. Bas Kruger, from the Netherlands, with a lifetime devoting to history and especially maritime history. I am sure today with the very, it will be a very interesting period. And to the main event of today, the presentation of Bas Kruger. Bas studied maritime history at Leiden University with his, with his thesis on the loss of the first Dutch Navy steam gunboat, His Majesty Onrust, in 1859 on Borneo. He worked at the Air Force Museum and the Aviodome Aviation Museum, where a lifelong interest in World War II war in Pacific started, Pacific, specifically in the operations of the Netherlands East Indies Air Force, operating from Australia, including from Archerfield. Till 2015, he was director of the Netherlands Fortification Museum in the beautiful 17th century fortified town of Naarden. In this capacity, there were also numerous projects that involved Dutch fortifications in Indonesia. Since 2015, he is self-employed in cultural heritage projects, mainly focused on built heritage exhibitions and project management. In the past years, Bas has participated in several Australian Dutch heritage projects. These are some of the history events he will cover on his presentation. The Brisbane-based Camp Columbia project, research for the West Australian Museum's project on the Broome 3 March 1942 disaster, research into the crash of the Dutch P-25 bomber in Northwest Australia with one million builders on board, research into the 1942 Timor guerrilla campaign fought by Australian commandos and Dutch military troops, the rescue of the US bomber crew from Dutch New Guinea in 1944 by a Dutch-Australian US rescue team. Currently, Bas is working for the Dutch State Heritage Agency on an inventory of all Dutch military air aircraft losses since 1911 and remaining wreckage parts worldwide in Australia, those are the NAI AF Ra 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 RAF, Squadrons 18 and 120, Naval Air Service Dornier, the DO-24, and the Catalinas plus Dutch transport units. May I invite you? you. Well, good morning uh, uh, all here. Um, well, it's, it's a pleasure for me uh, to be here and to be able to, uh, to present uh, a few examples of Dutch-Australian cooperation during, uh, during the war. Um, like, like it was said, I'm here on a, a job for the Dutch State Heritage Agency, and I'll tell you a little more, a bit more about it uh, in a few turns. I was adequately uh, represented in my uh, history. I had that also a little bit in my speech, but... My own history as an, uh, a maritime historian, never worked in maritime history, but always in, uh, in aviation. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's very nice to, to be here and to, to see a few people I've corresponded since 1995 with, Peter Dunn here, now seeing him in, uh, in real life, that's, uh, that's really a pleasure. Well, uh, I'll be telling three of the many, many stories that could be told uh, about Dutch-Australian cooperation uh, in Timor, the rescue of a, a US B-25 crew in uh, Dutch New Guinea and, uh, and the broom disaster. I could have picked many, many more. I, even these are just a few of the very uh, the many examples that are, that are, are of uh, Dutch-Australian cooperation. Uh, mm -hmm. Gulf Force on Ambon, the Australian troops that were sent to Ambon in 1942 to defend the Dutch East Indies they were tragically defeated Dutch uh, submarines that operated from Australia. Uh, there's supposed to be one under a beach somewhere here near, uh, near Brisbane, submarine beach. Um, 
18 squadron flying from uh, the Darwin area, Dutch squadron within the Royal Australian Air Force, 120 squadron flying P-40 from Potshot and later from Rauke and Biak. Uh, we have the Lilliput convoys, that's a Dutch shipping that aided MacArthur and uh, the Australian troops in New Guinea. Uh, incidentally, that was, I think, the, the major contribution of the Dutch to the Allied war effort. About 856 ships, 15,000 merchant seamen that uh, uh, joined the Allied cause. The second or third largest uh, merchant navy in the world at that time. But there are also tragic stories like the infamous, uh, the, the, the picture of Sergeant Siffleet, an Australian within uh, operating with the Dutch intelligence, the uh, NAFIS, Netherlands East Indies uh, Forces Intelligence Service, and he was captured by the Japanese and beheaded like all his Dutch and Indonesian colleagues. But there's also the Dutch troops that joined an Australian division on the invasion of Tarakan and Balik Papan. So I just picked randomly a few, and there are many, many, many more. But for today, I picked three uh, which I've been working on the last couple of years. And the first one is the, the Broom disaster, March 3rd, 1942. Um, this is also uh, the reason I'm here for the Dutch State Heritage Agency. Uh, but I'll first tell you, tell you a little bit more about this disaster in Broome. Well, what happened on the 27th of February uh, 1942, <coughs> the uh, Allied fleet was sunk in the, the Battle of the Java Sea with uh, both uh, uh, Dutch, uh, British, Australian and American uh, ships in the, in the force. Uh, and that was the main commemorative occasion for the Dutch for many, many years and, and, and still is. But since, I think it's 2017 that the wrecks were illegally uh, recovered from the bottom of the uh, Java Sea and sold for scrap. Uh, there were no physical remains of that period uh, anymore um, until uh, the State Heritage Agency realized that there are still visible remains here in Australia of that period. That's the the wrecks of the, the Broom disaster. Um, so they gained in importance because it's the only thing physically remaining of the Dutch colonial period up till that time. Of course, we tried in 1945, 1949 to, uh, to hold on to Indonesia, but you can say that the colonial period really ended in, uh, in 1942. And so these wrecks are uh, especially important for that a commemorative purpose, but also for their intrinsic heritage value. Well, what happened after the Battle of the Java Sea uh, in the Dutch East Indies, they decided to evacuate key personnel to Australia, and they took nine flying boats, Dornier flying boats and Catalina flying boats, to fill them up with uh, key military staff and fly them out here to Australia. In the chaotic uh, period there, uh, uh, some, or maybe even uh, a number, a great number of these uh, uh, officers took their wives and their children and even luggage. So other people had to stay behind in Java and, and there, well, that, that uh, caused some resent, uh, resentment uh, with the Dutch officers who came here to Australia. Their wives and children were still in Japanese camps while others took their wives and children here. But so these, these flying boats were filled to capacity with, uh, with people, I think about uh, 150 or so uh, on board. Uh, they were flying to Broome because they could reach Broome from Surabaya without refueling. Um, they had the idea to refuel in Broome and then fly south Port Hetland and further on. So in the morning of um, uh, the, the 3rd of March, they landed there, it was calm, and they thought we are safe. We were, have safely evacuated from war-torn Java We've come to peaceful Australia. We sit in the sun and wait till the, the flying boats are refueled, and then we go on. But what they didn't know, that a day before, uh, the 2nd of March, a Japanese reconnaissance plane had flown over uh, Broome, uh, saw that on the airfield there was activity in, the, in uh, Roebuck Bay. There was nothing at the moment, but on the airfield there were a lot of transport planes. There were no fighters' defenses, there were no anti-aircraft defenses, or. Not, not much to speak of. So the day later, they sent uh, a Japanese squadron from Timor that was just two weeks earlier captured, um, six Zero fighters and one uh, reconnaissance plane to Broome 
to um, to attack the place. And you can see the um, in the previous uh, presentation, th this one was shot from the, the Japanese reconnaissance plane, and you see the burning flying boats in the bay, and on the airfield you see also burning planes. Well, the people were sitting on the flying boats, some on the wings or on the on the sponsoons here on the on the sides, um, waiting for the refueling boat, and then the Japanese fighters uh, came in, and they shot every flying boat. Um, besides the, the nine Dutch ones, there were American flying boats, there was a Qantas uh, big flying boat, and on the airfield were uh, uh, American B-17, two B-24s. Uh, there was a DC-3 Dakota from the Dutch East Indies Airlines, a uh, Lockheed Lodestar from the Netherlands East Indies Air Force, uh, but there were, was no fighter defenses. The only uh, defense was done by one of the Dutch pilots, uh, Guus Winkel, he was flying the Lodestar. He took his machine gun from a side window, put it over his arm and shot down one of the zeros while burning his arm in the, in the process. Um, that was the only Japanese uh, loss that occurred uh, that day. But the, the flying boats were burning. There was burning fuel all over the water. Uh, people were swimming, trying to get to, uh, to the shore uh, while the, um, uh, uh, the refueling boat was very, very dangerously uh, sailing through the burning uh, fuel on the water to rescue people um, in Robert Bay. Um, well, that was, of course, a big disaster. 70 people, 70, 80 people were, were killed. Um, we don't know exactly, exactly how many, and not of all of them, their names, because it was a chaotic period. There were no passenger lists of these, uh, of these planes. Uh, at the same moment, um, you were telling about a, a B-25 with a million guilders on board. Well, there's a, a somewhat bigger story with uh, higher values of money involved. That's this DC-3 Dakota. It was another one uh, than the one on Broome Airfield. It was flying in from Java, flown by the famous uh, Russian-Dutch pilot Ivan Smirnov. Um, and he was also bringing people from Java to, uh, to Broome. The, the, the retreating Japanese, they were flying back to Timor, they saw the DC-3 and they thought, well, that's an easy target, we'll also shoot it down. But it didn't really count on Smirnov's capacity as a former fighter pilot to um, uh, maneuver the plane. One of the engines was, was set afire, but he was able to land in the surf at Karnau Beach and uh, thereby rescuing the, major, the majority of his uh, passengers. Uh, a few were killed uh, during, uh, during the fight and they were then on that beach, very remote area. He also got a package to bring to Australia from someone when he left Java. He didn't think about it, put it behind his chair. But then he left the plane in the surf and he thought, oh yeah, the package. He took the package and the moment he, he left the plane, a, a big wave hit him. He fell in the water and he lost the package and he th didn't think about it anymore till a, a, a few days later, a representative of the Dutch bank here in Australia asked him about the package, and he said, well, I lost it in the surf. And then he heard there was, um, in today's value, 15 million euros worth of diamonds in it. <laughs> and I think um, some of the um, uh, strandjutters, um, beachcombers, uh, after the war just in Australia f drove around in huge cars and spent a lot of money, and they, <laughs> found a number of those diamonds, but there still must be diamonds on that diamond beach, as it's called now. <laughs> so if you go there on a holiday, you never know uh, what you'll find. So that's maybe the, the one uh, uh, incident to laugh about <laughs> in this whole tragic story. Uh, well, this is why I'm here uh, these, uh, these few weeks to do an inventory of all the remains of the, the, the Broome disaster. They are in the uh, Aviation Heritage Museum in uh, Bull Creek in, uh, in Perth and in the Western Australia Museum in, uh, in Fremantle. Um, and they involve parts of the, of the, the, the aircraft, engines, gun turrets, uh, uh, or everything from that, but also personal belongings of the people in the, in the planes. The, the children brought toys, a, a toy Spitfire and a tin soldier, and this disc uh, is in the Western Australia Museum, and we identified it as being a disc of an insurance company, a Dutch Indonesian in, uh, Indian uh, insurance company that was given to their customers. Uh, so we'll do an inventory and to see what's here and how we can help those museums uh, preserve them. As you can see, 
they can use some preservation uh, if we want to keep them for the next generations. So that's the, the broom um, disaster. That's just one of those stories. The next one, oh, I forgot. This is the, the, the one of the final things we, we hope to, uh, to build. After that, um, the RCA, the Dutch State Heritage Agency, has done this for Dutch ship shipwrecks all over the world. From uh, the start, the early start of um, the Dutch East India Company, uh, um, and there are now uh, 1,640 um, known wrecks all over the world, Dutch shipwrecks. As you can see, there's lots of them in the uh, in the Indies. Uh, there's 102 here, but there's also a huge number of them in the West Indies, 53, 43 Suriname, but Holland only, uh, and the, the 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 Dutch area has 832. Um, and we hope to, to add to this another layer of aviation history. Uh, this is called maritime stepping stones. We won't call ours aviation stepping stones because that would be a rather awkward abbreviation. Uh, so we do something like historical aviation. We hope to add about 800 lost uh, Dutch aircraft uh, from 1911 up till now. And a major, the major proportion will be here in the Asia Pacific region. In European region here and also a number of them here in the United States where the Dutch had a, a flying school during the war. Well up to the the second uh, story I've been researching this is about uh, an American B-25 bomber uh, that was flying in uh, the summer of 1944 on missions around uh, uh, Dutch New Guinea hunting for Japanese shipping um, to to sink them to get the Japanese uh, loose supplies. Um, there's an artist impression of this uh, of this bomber, um, and it was flown on a mission from Wagde, a small airfield on the mainland of New Guinea, uh, with three other bombers around uh, the Bird's Head Peninsula of uh, New Guinea. Two going north, two going south, and they met here and found a Japanese barge here. They shot it up and sank it, but the last B-25 coming in. Uh, piloted by, uh, by Ira Barnett, was hit by Japanese anti-aircraft fire and then in, in an engine and in the rudders and it tried to fly back to one of the Allied bases in San Sapor or Biak, but because the engine and the rudder was hit, it deviated to the south and Barnett thought, well, if I don't want to go all the way into the ocean somewhere there, I have to crash land it and he, uh, sought an, uh, he, he thought he saw an open area and landed the plane in there. Well, and if you look a little bit, you can see <laughs> the plane is here. It just broke just after the fuselage, uh, just after the wings, the fuselage broke, but for the rest it's, uh, it's intact and that makes it one of the unique wrecks, uh, I think, because all the other wrecks we find in New Guinea, and there must be literally hundreds uh, of them, are almost always completely broken up, uh, burned or shattered, but this one uh, is supposed to be a very good condition. Why was it so interesting uh, for me? Because I learned that the, um, the crew was rescued from this remote spot. It's about, um, well, if you can see the map here, this is about 60 miles to the coast, and it's swamp and jungle, and yeah, you don't walk through the coast. Normally, if a, if a pilot was, was hit and he had to uh, crash land his plane, he tried to ditch it uh, in the water, and then a Catalina flying boat from the an emergency rescue squadron could pick up the crew and bring them back. If not, they were stuck in the jungle or mountains or whatever, and almost all of them were lost, uh, either by diseases or hunger or thirst, or captured by the Japanese, and then you had a fair chance uh, your head would come off. Um, and there's even known one of the, the story of an American pilot who crash landed here near Babo, and he took his own life because he, he thought, well, I can't be rescued and I won't stand for the horrors of uh, captivity. But these guys were stuck here. One of their squadron mates uh, saw them land, flew over them, and thought, well, I have to ask to bring them out. And there was that possibility. You can't see it on the map, uh, on the, on the map here, but there is a, a large river going up here with a side stream, uh, the Kaiser River. And... Um, it was asked to uh, the Dutch NICA, the Netherlands uh, Indie Civil Administration, who had a, an office here on Biak, 
troops as well to help the Americans. Can you send in a team to rescue the crew? Well, they could. Uh, that my, was my first indication that the Dutch were involved. There was a, a rescue team uh, put together uh, from uh, about 10 Dutch and Dutch East Indies uh, troops led by this Lieutenant Louis Radmund, who was born in, uh, in Java, 1910. And there was an, a very interesting Australian detachment, the Jungle Training Detachment, and that was led by this Captain Mac Gillespie, uh, originally Scotsman and immigrated with his uh, parents to Australia. Um, and that Jungle Training Detachment uh, learned survival techniques to Allied pilots in Natsap, New Guinea. Uh, but they were also supposedly involved in rescuing downed aircraft. Uh, but there's very, very little to be found in, uh, in the archives about them. I know they've rescued about 300 aircrew in 60 rescue missions, uh, most of them behind enemy lines. And a few intriguing points can be found in the archives that there was a number of these guys in the Philippines before the Americans landed there, there in uh, October 44. Uh, they were there to rescue Allied aircrew. Um, so if anyone wants to have a nice piece of research uh, done, this jungle training detachment, in my opinion, uh, deserves a lot of um, research uh, effort. But they, these were also called in with uh, Bill Godard and Don Reardon two Australians also in that uh, team, um, plus uh, American infantry group uh, that, was, that was asked for volunteers on BIAC. 600 men volunteered to go, and uh, 13 were picked to, to join this rescue mission. Well, they were all flown in by a Catalina flying boat uh, here up to, the, to here, and then uh, Louis Radmund asked uh, the local Papua people for help. They provided him with canoes and, uh, and rowers, and they rowed up river to Kampung Baru, that's somewhere here, that's called New Village. Um, and from there, uh, he sent out a small sub-team with the, uh, mainly the Australians uh, in it, four Australians and uh, an Indonesian uh, guide. He took, that's, uh, oh, where is he? I think it's this guy, Marlisse. He was an interpreter. Um, and with uh, the Papuans. Um, and then they set out on, with canoes into the, into the swamp, and that swamp is area is huge. I mean, for the Dutch guys here in the audience, so groot as the province Utrecht, <laughs> so that's, that's fairly huge. Um, and they had to find their way in somewhere. There were aerials taken of the, of the swamp, uh, and they were translated into a map, so they more or less could find their way but it took them uh, four or five days in the swamp to find, finally find uh, the crew. Uh, they had uh, uh, taken up uh, a, a balloon. They had a balloon in the aircraft to bring a, an antenna up, a Gibson Girl antenna, and you could see it from, say, seven, 800 meters distance. Um, and that balloon that was led up by, by the crew, the, the crew is here, Ira Barnett, pilot, Harold Tentokwijin, the air gunner, uh, Tom Wright, the navigator, and P Pete Whitland, the radio operator, and which I'm very proud that uh, his daughter is here in the, uh, in the audience. Um, and uh, he led up the balloon with the antenna so the rescue team could see the balloon, and then finally they found the crew and brought them back. Well, this picture was taken in front of the church in Kampung Baru, that's still there. I was there in 2019. Um, and very, very interesting, we met the the last surviving member of this rescue team, that was this little boy, Paulus, a Papua, who was then 90 years old, which is incredibly old for a Papua. They, on average, they don't get much older than 50 years. But he was there, unfortunately, a little bit lost in the head. Uh, so he could mumble a few Dutch words, and we could shake his hand, but that, that was about it. He couldn't tell us where the plane was. <laughs> and you could see from the pictures that, I mean, when, once we went to the swamp, it was... I mean, it was useless. I mean, it, it could have been here. You can't see it. You're just looking at your feet. And I mean, so we walked uh, two miles up, two miles down, and it took us the whole day um, in that huge area. Although I, I, from aerials, I know fairly well where it must be. I mean, this is the only open area. And uh, even today, this is still open. But we walked, I think, somewhere up to here and then turned around and went, uh, went back. 
So in um, next year, we hope to go back. We thought this was 2019. We go back next year, but then COVID came and it all, uh, it all uh, stopped. Uh, last May, I was in Papua looking for a Japanese uh, bomber, which we found, but that was much easier on a, on a mountain. Um, but now we go back next year. We have an, uh, a German guy coming with us. He has a drone with a magnetometer under it so we can see through the foliage and we can see um, uh, metal objects and there are t two huge engines and he's uh, certain he can find those two engines. We have five uh, locations we can, can search and then um, find the wreck. Not to recover it because I think it's, well, practically it's, it can be done but it costs a huge amount of money. Um, but we want to honor the crew and the, um, the rescue team and the Papuans who, uh, who did this um, and then place a, place a plaquette near the aircraft. Um, and then it gives a true end to the story, in my opinion. So this is story two. Do I have time for a third or uh, am I uh, <laughs> at the end of my time? That's Timor, 1942. Also an intriguing story, and I think even in Australia it's little known that uh, there was a, a, an Australia commando detachment in Timor fighting a guerrilla war for almost the whole year 1942. Um, a lot of attention is always, of course, on New Guinea, on Kokoda, uh, the desert rats in North Africa, things like that, but Timor guerrilla is not very much uh, known. Uh, but what's even less known is that there was also a Dutch detachment with the Australians. The, the remains of the Dutch forces on Timor, about 300 soldiers joined the 200 plus Australia commandos. Um, but these Dutch guys were uh, very much less effective than the Australians. Why? Because the Australians were commandos, trained as commandos to operate behind enemy lines. They were young. Uh, and the Dutch guys were mostly conscripts, older, and had a lot of Indonesian, Dutch Indonesian troops who are, were a little less inclined to fight for their colonial bosses now. The Japanese had conquered Java, but still they were there. Um, and the main purpose, while by both these troops were on, uh, or were kept on Timor by express orders by MacArthur, was to bind Japanese troops. Um, the Japanese were then fighting for uh, the Kokoda Trail on their way to Port Moresby, and they almost got there. I, I think they could see Port Moresby from uh, the Owen Stanley Mountains, and then they were stopped. But had they had the extra 10 to 12,000 troops on Timor, well, you never know what might have happened. Maybe they could have d done that little extra push and just captured Port Moresby, Moresby and then History well, would not be completely different because the war would have ended with uh, nuclear bombs, I think. But it, at, at that time, it would have been a disaster cutting off Australia from uh, American supplies. So these guys, all in all, had a vital role. Uh, interestingly, the Dutch had their own uniforms, weapons uh, and stuff, but they were later resupplied from Australia. And you can see that from this picture, these are really you can see from, from these guys are Dutch Indonesian soldiers with a, uh, an Indo, what we call mixed uh, Dutch Indonesian and, and a Dutch guy. And he has a Knil helmet. This guy has a Knil Klewang, uh, the Sabre, Dutch uh, East Indies Sabre. They have Dutch rifles, but they have an Australian brand gun, uh, helmets, shirts, shoes. And they're helped by a Criado, a, port a Timorese people who helped uh, the Allied forces at first, and then the Japanese, um, well, put half of, of the Timorese people against each other, and they really fought each other as well as, as, well as the, uh, the Allied uh, troops. Well, I got involved because I was researching this guy, Captain Max Horsting. Uh, he was killed just after the war in October 45 near Bandu. Um, I was researching him for some other projects, and I was contacted by the uh, group of people who were researching this book. Uh, they didn't want to bend or to bow because every prisoner of the Japanese every morning had to bow for the emperor to Tokyo. And these guys didn't want to, to bow or bend. It was a research project from children and grandchildren of the Timor veterans who wanted to have their fathers and grandfathers stories told. So they were researching all these um, uh, stories of their fathers, but Horsting had been killed, 
and they were looking for someone who could do his story. So I joined the research project. Um, and um, well, it was, was very interesting. A uh, little known story for myself uh, too. Uh, it all, all was fought here on more or less on Portuguese Timor uh, in, in the mountains, a much different landscape from, from the jungles of uh, the Netherlands East Indies. I think it's more like Northern Australia, uh, dry and uh, craggy hills. Um, well, the, the guys finally in the November uh, 42 were evacuated by a Dutch destroyer to Darwin. And then they had, could uh, get a little rest and recuperation in Camp Darley. That's the picture here. And this is Horstink again. And this is the old Dutch captain who was then commander of the, uh, <laughs> the Dutch guerrillas. You can see he was quoted by the Australians as a bit as a, a dour and sour person. Well, he doesn't look very optimistic here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but... Um, well, this is also on, on patrol on Timor, and this was a victory parade in Melbourne, I think, in December uh, uh, 42. Um, well, besides this very interesting piece of research, there was also another intriguing story. Uh, in 2003, uh, uh, Australian peacekeepers, uh, UN force, were on Timor between the Timorese and the Indonesians. Indonesians had taken over Dutch Timor, of, of course, after the war. And then when the Portuguese government in, uh, in 1974, the Salazar regime, fell, all the colonies had something like, oh, what are we going to do? And Timor wanted to become independent, and Indonesia uh, thought, well, this is our chance to take over. Unfortunately, actively supported by Australia at that moment, uh, who said, well, that's, they were one of three or four uh, nations in the UN who didn't vote against uh, 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 an Indonesian takeover of Portuguese Timor. Um, but after a very, very bloody war and insurrection by the Timorese in 2000, they got independent. And later, uh, UN forces were sent in between the, the two nations. And Conan Bland, he's also from uh, Queensland, he was a UN soldier then, and he came upon this cave with 38 skulls in them. And as he said, all with bullet holes in them. So when he reported that to the, the researching people of the, of the book, uh, we thought, well, that might be uh, Dutch or Dutch Indonesian troops because we have still 40 missing in action in, uh, in Timor. I think Australia has two or three, but the Dutch have about 40 of them. And from his description and a few vague pictures he had from 2003, we thought, well, my, maybe they are these troops. We also thought that this Australian Corvette, the Armidale, they brought in reinforcements, uh, 30 November uh, 1942, but was sunk by Japanese uh, fighters and bombers. And while uh, a great number of uh, uh, people were rescued, uh, finally, because it took some days, there was one raft with 40 people on it that was seen from the air and was seen a day later and then the, the day after. They couldn't land the flying boats because the sea was too rough. Uh, two days later, the raft had disappeared. So there was some thought, could they just have drifted ashore on Timor? Could the Japanese Navy have captured them and brought them ashore and then killed them, uh, cut off their heads and thrown the skulls in the, in the cave? Um, so we thought from this research group, let's see if we can find some evidence to see if it's Dutch or not. Um, I found two uh, Dutchmen living in, uh, in Dili now in Timor, Heli Bouwman and uh, Camille van Lenteren, and they agreed to help me research this. Uh, they both gone out with uh, clues from Conan where to look, what region, uh, what the village looked like. Uh, it was a short walk from the village, uh, half an hour, three quarters of an hour. Um, so they went searching, and at first Heli found a cave with seven complete skeletons uh, in it. And the Timorese people there said to her, they must be European because the bones are too large for to be uh, Timorese. But it was in the wrong area and it was complete skeletons and not 38 skulls. So she again started looking and finally, uh, I think three weeks, four weeks ago, she found uh, the cave uh, with the help of uh, two Australian officers who are detached to the Timorese armed forces to help them. Uh, they joined uh, the effort. Um, and they found the cave. 
but now we think now it's it's from an earlier period in 1912 there was also uh, a revolution against the portuguese um, occupiers of timor um, and they there was a, a bloody war at that moment and that's not bullet holes it's um, uh, arrows or spears or whatever so probably it's not from um, the, the survivors of the armadale and the armadale we now know we research a little bit more was much further from Timor than I, uh, I thought. And probably the raft just broke up. Uh, people died aboard the raft or in the ocean. Um, but still, uh, we have the other cave to go to. Uh, and when I fly home, I, uh, my last stop here in, uh, in Australia is Broome, where I do the, the, the Broome project. And then through Darwin, I fly to Dili. And with uh, Camille and Hilly and uh, Major Guy Warnock of the Australian Forces, we go up to the other cave. And fortunately, there's also uh, an Australian uh, forensic anthropologist uh, from the police who assists the Timorese police. And she's willing to go as well. And she might be able to see if these are Europeans or maybe uh, mixed Dutch-Indonesian uh, people in the, the seven skeletons. And then uh, we can bring this to a conclusion. If so, and if it's convincingly that they are Dutch or European, then we will inform uh, the Dutch and the Australian Armed Forces and they have in the identification and recovery people to take over uh, together with the War Graves uh, Committee. If they are Timorese, which is also possible because the, the, the Timorese uh, lost during World War II between 50,000 and 100,000 people and during the Indonesian Timorese wars also something like a hundred thousand does that whole island must be uh, thousands thousands of skeletons still and they, they they the people there keep them in the caves and they are holy places uh, when uh, hilly and camille went there they had to leave a few packets of cigarettes for the dead um, so if they are timorese we'll just leave them uh, but if they are uh, dutch or australian we'll inform the uh, the authorities and then take it uh, take it from there so these are three of the, the things I've been researching for the last couple of years. Um, I could keep you here all day for, for <laughs> other things, but let's not do that. Um, so my final sheet, thank you very much for your, your attention. If there are questions, uh, well, there's time for it. If you want to contact me, um, please, here's my email and telephone. I have a few business cards with me, so I can give you those. Um, and maybe for, for questions now, if there are. Sorry? Can you give a plug to the book? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I, um, I've, I've written a book on, uh, on, this, uh, on this story. Um, because, well, I mean, this, the story, it, I mean, it's a true story, and there are a lot of horrors in it, but it's also, it reads like the script of a Hollywood movie. I mean, four American guys just land in a huge swamp. The air gunner, Harold Tentaquidgeon, was the chief of a Native American tribe. He was 44 years old at that time, was an old man in a young man's war, but he volunteered to fly in, uh, in these bombers. Um, then there's the, the rescue team, which is a very mixed group of, uh, of people, Dutch, Australians, Indonesians, Dutch Indonesians, Indos, that's also nice. Um, there's Japanese that being ambushed, uh, on a, in a very clever way, and that's where the, the, the tragic part, of course, come in, comes in because a lot of the Japanese were killed. Uh, but uh, a group of them were captured, and they were flown out with a Catalina flying boat from this Kais River. But on their way to Biak, two of them tried to capture the flying boat. So they, they fought in the flying boat, and in the final report you can read, well, one of them tried to escape through the blister. Yep. Of course, fell down <laughs> 3,000 feet in the ocean, but... And I found pictures of that. So, uh, not of the guy falling out, but of the <laughs> Japanese sitting in the Catalina and later three of them standing in Biak, uh, four going in, three going out. The rescue operation in the swamp with the leeches and the mosquitoes and all the, the nasty stuff. And finally, in the, in the kampong, it's uh, uh, here, they have the uh, final dinner and they have songs, they sing all national anthems. Uh, they have a, a rijstafel, which is of course always very good to have a rijstafel, but the Dutch guys know that. Uh, it's the best food there is, I think, in the, in the world. Uh, <laughs> you might, uh, might argue for other things, but so. Indonesian banquets. 
<laughs> yeah, Indonesian banquet with all kinds of little tasty foodstuffs. So this, this story is, is really uh, incredible, and I, I wrote a little book uh, uh, on it. Oh, yeah, 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 the book is here. <laughs> so uh, if you uh, look at uh, Amazon, you can uh, find it in Kais uh, Kreuger. It's available in English as well, yeah, English and, uh, and Dutch. And I hope next year, if we find the plane and we have pictures of it, yeah, we can make a, a second uh, edition and uh, truly end this story. What does Kais stand for? That's the river, the river Kais, yeah. yeah. Is there crocs in that swamp river? Well, I haven't seen them, but <laughs> <laughs> there were a lot of frogs, not crocs, <laughs> but frogs, because Harold caught uh, frogs on the wing of the B-25. He cut his, their legs off, so they had a delicious French meal every <laughs> evening, uh, cooked frog legs. <laughs> How long was they waiting to be rescued? Uh, three weeks. Yeah. So they sat on that wing three weeks. If you, I can't zoom in, but if you look on the, uh, on the wing, I, it, it's a very high quality picture. Uh, you can see that there's the letters food written here. So they wanted to have food. And for me, a very intriguing but frustrating, if I can, can get another minute, is that last year I found one of the uh, grandchildren of the Americans in the rescue team, and he told me my father, my grandfather, left me a, 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 an army box. Within it, all the aerials and the maps to the location. And I said, well, oh, that's it, great. And then he stopped corresponding, but he, because he thinks we want to sell the plane commercially, commercially. So I know there's someone in the United States who has a box with everything in it. I need to find the plane, and he doesn't want to help us. Ah. <laughs> but find it, we will. Yeah. Uh, just one quick one for me. Uh, that map you had, could you please put that in scale? I can't get it in my head where it sits to Australia. And the this one? Yeah, this is, this is uh, New Guinea, uh, the bird's head, the, the mainland is all the way there. Oh, so it's right to the west. The yeah, north yeah, north yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is it possible that the wreck doesn't exist anymore because the scrap merchant no. in got to it? No, 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 no. Now, we talked to, uh, to local people. We were there with the local people. Their fathers knew exactly where it is. It's in an area where they hunt but they don't hunt there anymore, and it's, well, it's impossible to reach. And a scrap hunter, it's so little metal, it's almost useless for them to, to go there all the way. Yeah. Just on that point, in 79, I went to Solomon's as a young teen, mm. teenager, and we sat in a um, Mitsubishi Zero, <laughs> the and all the instruments are gone, but it was all yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they're not that interested in the no. shell. No, what they use it for is, um, uh, in 1999, I was in uh, Lake Sentani with Jayapura, also in New Guinea, and uh, the locals cut pieces of the aircraft and made spoons out of it or uh, tin cups or things like that. That's what they use it for. We found a Japanese bomber um, and about 18 meters. It was like a, a circle saw had sawn off the plane, but that's the, the depth they can reach by diving. So, <laughs> and then... Snel even zagen, up and up. But the rest of it, it was lying like this. So everything here was okay, and from here it was completely cut up. But still, uh, last year we found a, a P-40, I think it's an Australian P-40 here, in, in fairly good uh, condition. Uh, we found a Japanese bomber here, in near Sansapur, in the mountains, completely crashed, but in, in uh, very good physical condition, the, the items. And my friend Max, he has a diving resort here in the Raja Ampat. Uh, there are still uh, Bailey bridges here. There are, well, you can find, uh, we found, I think, seven uh, Amtrak uh, amphibious tractors here at Sansapur. They were used in the invasion. They're still there in the jungle with their cargo on board. Forklifts still sitting there. So <laughs> enough to see. How do you go with the Indonesian government getting permits to go into the territory there? Uh, going there is not a problem. Taking something is. Uh, because my friend is, is working there for 25, 30 years now. He has a company. 
So we go there as uh, battlefield tourists, and as long as we don't take stuff with us, it's okay. But taking it, that's another other yeah, thing. That. Well, that's a bit of a discussion because they don't do anything with it. They just let it rot. Um, and just in 2019, there was the unique uh, find of a Glenn Martin bomber, a Dutch bomber that was used by the Dutch East Indies Air Force. There's only one left in the US Air Force Museum. One crashed in uh, Kalimantan, Borneo, uh, on a mountaintop. And it's in, well, it's, of course, it's, it, it, it crash landed, but it's in fairly good, complete condition. So we want to, from uh, the Dutch Air Force Museum, want to research it. But Indonesia is very, very difficult. Even about going there, there's uh, supposed to be four crew members still in the plane, and we can't get permission to go there and recover them and give them a nice, uh, a good burial. So it's still very difficult, yeah. Are you working together with the Japanese? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's also, that's, that's interesting because for years I've tried to contact them, but it's so very hard to contact them. While I hear from Max that sometimes even now Japanese groups come over to New Guinea to, to look for their forefathers and uh, uh, burn them and bring the ashes to Japan. But I haven't been able to get in touch with any Japanese organization uh, on that, no. Plus also on Timor, I think the interesting thing was that at the start when the Japanese were um, coming in, the, um, the Dutch took over Portuguese. <laughs> yeah, the, the Dutch and the Australians occupied Portuguese Timor and the Portuguese, Portuguese of, of, of course, objected. They were neutral during the war, but still the two countries occupied their colony. And it, for a moment, it looked like war would break out between Portugal and, and uh, Australia and, and, and Holland. But then, well, Portugal did like this. Uh, they had hoped to stay neutral, but the Japanese always had plans to, to occupy, to protect the Timorese. Uh, and use the airfields for uh, the fight against Australia. This was their closest airfield to, I think, to Darwin, to Broome. Uh, uh, so it was very useful for them. But we did something we shouldn't have done. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you.